we also see a, a purpose to continue. This cleave that we're talking about, that's not somebody's name. That's something we're supposed to be doing, amen? A commitment, uh, a purpose to continue together. Anybody ever hear someone say something like this? You know, when they got together, everybody thought they were perfect for each other. They were the greatest couple that we'd ever seen. What happened? I just believe in most cases, no, no, no. In all cases, this really is the truth. It's not even what happened. It's what they allowed themselves to believe. They did not go into that relationship with a mindset that this is forever. We shall continue. We will continue. You know, when it comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ, as a born-again Christian, the Christian faith is designed to be a continuing faith. How many would agree? Amen. If you got saved today, tomorrow you want to be able to say, I'm growing in the Lord. Right. I'm further on today than I was yesterday. If today you were sadly in a condition where you had to say, I don't love the Lord as much today as I did a, a year ago, that would be heartbreaking, wouldn't it? As a matter of fact, some of you are sitting here right now and that might even be the case. I'll just tell you this, there's no doubt about it. If your relationship with the Lord isn't where it needs to be, you can understand why your relationship with your husband or wife isn't where it ought to be. Amen? Yeah. Amen? That's right. There has to be a mindset that I got saved, I'm saved, it's settled, and I'm going to continue in my walk and relationship with the Lord. That's my highest priority, and it has to be your highest priority. And with that mindset, think about what the Lord can do in your marriage. If you have that part right when it comes to your relationship with the Lord. John chapter 15 verse 9 says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. How about that? I love you. Jesus says, I love you. I love you. So what do you need to do? Continue. Continue in my love. Not continue in you. Not continue in what you can do. But you continue in my love love. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. Continue, the word continue. Hey, do a power, do, 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 a, do a search with the word continue. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. We talk about an attitude of gratitude. You will have thanksgiving if you continue. Have an attitude of we're going to do this, we're going to keep at this, and we're going to stay with this, and we're going to continue. We're going to do this with our relationships with the Lord. I'm going to do that. You're going to do that with the Lord. When we have that attitude, watch what the Lord will do in our in every in all of our relationships. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I, I love that verse. It's all there. Continue to do what God shows you because you can know that what he shows you is right and it's true and it's what you need to do. You see, this continuance has never been more necessary than in our marriage relationships. And you talk about marriage being under attack today. It's under attack in a greater way than I can ever know of or think of in the past. I, I just reminded myself of how many decades I've been around, so there's a little bit of past for me to think about, and I can tell you I have never seen us as a country, as a world, in a worse condition today when it comes to our attitude towards marriage. Yeah. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that years ago, when Anita and I were called to the Akshan Indian Reservation as missionaries. I, I did what many missionaries do. I, I would go on deputation, and I also had a secular job while I was on deputation. Deputation is, is the missionary going to different churches other, and sharing with Christians uh, their vision for the ministry that God has called them to. The secular job that I was working during the time while I was making some money and, and then preparing to go on deputation, and so we're preparing to go to the Auction Indian Reservation in Arizona, was that I drove a taxi cab in Palm Springs, California. 
Anybody ever been to Palm Springs, California? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's a it's a it's an internationally known place. I mean, hey, any place that had Sonny Bono for the mayor, it's got to be. You know. <laughs> I'll tell you something else about uh, Palm Springs, California, uh, Cathedral City, which is a, another town right near there. Especially congregating in the, in the Cathedral City area is a very, very large, very large homosexual uh, population. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know this until I was driving a cab. But, you know, when you're driving a cab, guess what? Your job is to do what? To pick person up, person up, and take them from point A to point B, and wherever point B is, wherever they want to go. And uh, guess what I learned? I learned that most of the bars in that town were not heterosexual bars. They were homosexual bars, and that's where all this... I, I, I got a glimpse into a culture that I can tell you is not being revealed to you on television or even in the world. You, you drive by a bar that's on a corner just not very far from your church that is a gathering of homosexuals. The reason why there's no huge, big, not giant neon sign is because they don't want you to know everything that's going on over there. But I'm going to tell you what, when you find out what's really going on, it'll break your heart. It will break your heart. Did you know that uh, in the homosexual community, that a, uh, the, a, a person, uh, especially back in the 80s and 90s, when, when AIDS was first being understood as the tragic, uh, killing monster that it was, that the average lifespan for somebody involved in that kind of a life was in their late 40s to early 50s. They were used to just burying people all the time. Uh, as I got to uh, know some of these people, they would just uh, flippantly talk about, oh, he's dead now. Oh, she, she's dead now. Oh, yeah, he's dead. And I'm going to tell you something else that goes on in that community. And I'm telling you, uh, please know where I'm going with this. What's going on in heterosexual, uh, in, in, in the lives of heterosexuals when it comes to sex outside of marriage is absolutely wrong, and it, it, it is against God, and there's no doubt about it, and God hates it. That's right. I'm going to tell you that, so don't misunderstand where I'm going to go with this, but what I want to explain to you is, is something I want you to get this morning. In the homosexual lifestyle, in that homosexual uh, way of life, and by the way, it is it is absolutely wrong and sinful and perverted, no doubt about it. There is also, but even just just for a moment, setting aside the whole issue of people of the same sex involving themselves together, uh, is the issue of promiscuity. There uh, there are typically uh, five to six times more partners involved in this kind of lifestyle than there is even in the heterosexual community. And by the way, we as uh, as heterosexuals, it's tragic when I hear basketball players lifted up and bragging about you know their two to three thousand conquests that they've had. How wrong and how tragic is that? It is absolutely wrong. I'll tell you where I'm going to go with this. So now, if we are even from Washington, supposed to recognize uh, same-sex relationships as 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 okay and acceptable, and even say that that marriage relationship is is no different than a marriage between a husband and wife. You know, and I know that that's not God's plan. That's not God's way. But even more than most people appreciate, it is you talk about a country that is headed in a direction that I can absolutely guarantee you is, is tragic, it's about to happen. And, and, I'm, and unless, unless God gets a hold of us and wakes us up, we are in big trouble. You say, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm saying that the very fact that we're preaching and teaching about continuing in a marriage relationship is so now foreign to this world that people can't even fathom it. They can't even appreciate it. And so the, the homosexual uh, 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 situation that people don't even fully understand is now being integrated into what is supposed to be called marriage. And I tell you, the last thing that most now, that group and just about anybody in this world understands and appreciates is the idea that you get married 
once and you stay married. And you're married for life. You say, preacher, you can't talk that way. You're going to be picking on some of the people who, who, have, who have been married more than once or twice. And uh, I'm here to tell you, they're the first ones to tell this pastor, you preach it God's way and you preach it God's plan so that my children don't make the same mistake that I made and don't have to go through the same pain that I went through. Continue. Get back to knowing that God wants you to continue. Notice Mark chapter 10 verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. For then they are no more twain but one flesh. That therefore, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Amen. And you know what's happening today? I'm just going to tell you. Man is putting asunder what God has joined together. When we change uh, God's plan and we want to have a new plan, it's the wrong plan. There's no doubt about it. You know, may I tell you, if, if I have the opportunity to counsel with you before you say I do, one of the first things that I want to say to you is this. Never, ever use the word divorce. What? What do you mean? What are you talking about? Can I tell you that from this pulpit and from any any teaching or preaching that goes on in this in this building or, or having anything to do with Maranatha Baptist Church, we stand for marriage around here. And we stand for staying in the marriage. And we stand for doing everything that you can do to make that marriage work. And we stand for coming alongside one another and encouraging each other in that area. Have you ever noticed how it works? People say, I want a church wedding. But I'll have a secular divorce. Mm -hmm. I'll not talk to anybody about what I'm going to do. I'm just going to run off and do it. Mm -hmm. That's not God's plan. That's not the way it's supposed to be done. May I tell you something? We need, we need to early on teach our young people that the word divorce is not part of your, your vocabulary. Yep. Don't, you know what? You know how many people, uh, when they would get upset, they would use the word divorce, and the next thing they would say is, I didn't really mean that. Oh, I was just mad, and I just wanted to bug them, and so I said that. And then a couple of more months went by, and then and you, and you did kind of mean it. It mattered a little bit more when you said it. As a matter of fact, uh, a year or two goes by, and you're still fighting like a couple of crazy people, and the word is thrown out every single time somebody gets mad. How hard is it then to go ahead and do that? You haven't sought counsel. You haven't determined... We're going to do all that we can do to make this work. You've opened the door. You've opened the door of possibility that divorce is an option. Again, please don't misunderstand me. We're not telling anybody that they're supposed to stay in an abusive relationship or any of these kinds of things. And so you can send me your emails and you can come to me and say, but you you got to know in this situation, that situation, hey, that's fine. But what do you want to teach your children? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to lower your standards or do you want to raise the bar to where God's standards are? Hmm. If we take that word out of our vocabulary in the first place, I'll tell you, it'll make a big difference. You know, that's what continuing on is all about. Christopher Columbus, I know he has uh, sure gotten a lot of bad press in the last 25 or 30 years. I remember when I was a kid, we actually used to celebrate Christopher Columbus and that was a special day. But now, you know, we get to hear all this other kind of crazy stuff. But you know what? Don't believe everything you hear in the media. As a matter of fact, if you ever get a chance to do a little bit of reading on your own, and reading's still okay, by the way, it really is, yeah. um, do something like get a hold of Christopher Columbus's diary. And you know, he, he did see a lot in his lifetime. And uh, when you decide you're going to climb onto a ship and go across the ocean, uh, that's that's a big deal, and everybody that's involved in anything like that knows that that's a big deal. You want to know what was in his diary that will really strike you as important? He continued to say something like this. He would talk about, oh, well, we stopped at this island, and there were these things there, and, and this was the landscape, and, and we saw this, and we saw that. And then he would continue to say, today we sailed. Today we sell on. And then he would say a little bit more, and then he would say, Today we sell on. 